<coughs> you all notice that I have brought these pictures of the two trees up here. I, I think they both relate to the tree of life. One of them, uh, one of the messages relates partially to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. evil. Uh, these two <coughs> pictures, as much as you have heard of the pictures that uh, Dave Teague has done, which are oil on canvas, I think uh, six of them now he has completed are hanging in the home office for one for each of the holy days. So he's still got two to go. It takes him a year to do one of those in oil and canvas. These two pictures right here, I think are very, very profound. Now, um, we used to hear Mr. Armstrong talk a lot about the two trees in the garden. But these two trees, he just sat down with a pencil and a piece of paper one day, and he did both of these in one day. And to me, they have such impactful meaning that um, I, I, I'm really incredulous that he was able to do those two trees in a day. And he, you know, he, he made up the uh, theme of the trees. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is basically, as you look at it, you can see the roots going down into the ground look exactly like the hands of man. So then all throughout the tree, you see different branches which are shaped in the hands of man. So his indication that he's trying to convey is that it is the hands of man which lead to the knowledge of good and evil. You see, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tree which has a mixture on it, isn't it? When you... Think about that name, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so that's kind of interesting. The other one, the tree of life, is, not, is, is a tree that was not forbidden by God. But you look at it, uh, it was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God said, don't touch it, don't eat the fruit thereof. And uh, he didn't say, he didn't put any restrictions on the tree of life. Not initially. We'll, sh we'll show later on, he did restrict access to the tree of life. So, those two pictures here, I brought them up just to illustrate uh, partly the sermons. You know, the one with the tree of life is shaped like a woman about to give birth with a child right in the center part of it and children throughout the tree. And uh, so that's kind of interesting as well. <clears throat> the Bible speaks in terms which may be confusing to people who are not being called. Now, these two pictures and, and the names of those two trees, they may be confusing to most people. And in fact, I think they, they are. Not, we could just drop the maybe part. But the Bible gives us an indication of why it is, what it is, and why it is that God is speaking in terms which are confusing to most people. As a part of the introduction to this sermonette, I have quoted Matthew chapter 13, verses 10 through 13. Now the whole, the whole chapter, Matthew 13, is a really, really relevant chapter to us. 
but it's a hard chapter to really understand. It's an easy chapter to read. But you have to understand that Christ is not speaking in just ordinary terms. So after he had started in Matthew 13, he was uh, speaking here from a boat. His disciples were in the boat with him. Thousands of people, apparently. Doesn't give us a number here, but very much like some of the other uh, examples where people came by the thousands to hear him speak. And you wonder if that means it was either a weekly Sabbath or a holy day that they came there because they would have had to travel some distance to get there and uh, to be able to assemble and then to go back home and uh, if they're working and so forth, uh, probably doesn't happen on a, a work day. So anyway, he had started speaking to them and, and then he went out into this boat on the water. The reason for going out into the boat on the water was because there's a natural amplification when you speak across the water you can be heard uh, a lot better than you can if you're just speaking off of the land. So he had gone out to the boat. His disciples gathered on the boat with him. So it was kind of an ideal situation where he could talk to his disciples and then he could turn and speak to the, to the crowd of people on the shore. And here the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? Why do you do that? Someday maybe I'll just give a sermon on parables. What a parable is. A parable. Not necessarily uh, try to explain all parables, but explain the, the simple things, uh, the common points of a parable. That's maybe somewhere down the road. Uh, lots of things I think, keep thinking over the years I'll get done, but I haven't gotten done yet. That's one of them. And so, so, look, they don't understand what you mean. That's what his disciples were saying. They don't understand what you mean. If you want them to understand, just tell them exactly what you mean. He didn't. He refused to do that, as a matter of fact. He told them, I don't want them to understand. That's a shocking statement to most of the modern Christian world. And they may read that and not, not even notice it. That's what's so remarkable about it. It's truly a miracle the way God has allowed things to be boldly stated in his Bible and yet be completely misunderstood by the world as a whole. It's a miracle. The disciples came and said to them, to him, why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said, to you, because I speak to them in parables, because to you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Now we stop right here and say, what was this chapter about? And he's sort of telling us right there, isn't he? That this chapter is about the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven or the coming of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, they didn't give it. So I've couched what I'm saying in these parables, so you can understand. That means we should understand, doesn't it? But to them, not yet. Not yet. Someday, but not yet. And he says in verse 12, Whosoever has, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whoever has not, 
that's going to be taken away from him, even that that he has. So I speak to them in parables, because they seeing do not see. Hearing, they do not hear. Neither do they understand. That's one of the themes, by the way, of the sermon. Understanding. We'll get to that in the sermon. At least, as uh, often is the case, one word or one uh, indication in the sermon may lead to the sermonette. Here I want to look at, in this sermonette, the example of the day given to Adam and Eve in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 2. Verses 16 and 17. The Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it. For in the day, now that's the phrase I'm focusing on in this sermonette. In fact, I entitled the sermonette, A Day. In the day that you eat thereof, you will surely die. Question is, can God be believed? Did Adam and Eve eat of that tree? And we don't really know, but doesn't really say but it seems like on the seventh day God created the Sabbath day and then this seems to be like maybe the very next day on first day of the week, maybe Sunday. They got into this difficulty. Maybe it wasn't the next day of the week. Maybe it was three months later. We don't really know. We don't know when it was. But whenever it was, they got into this difficulty because they disobeyed God. And uh, as we see here, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, I put these pictures up here. Uh, we had a couple of <coughs> new arrivals since I had explained a little bit about the pictures. And uh, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil has the hands of man all over it. And that was the one tree in the garden that God restricted. He didn't restrict the tree of life from men. Mr. Armstrong used to talk about that all the time. <clears throat> but you know, Christ spoke in parables. Why did he speak in parables? So that people wouldn't understand and... Here he speaks to Adam and Eve and says, In the day that you eat thereof, you will surely die. But God has different meanings that uh, he can apply. He obviously went to a lot of trouble, didn't he? Creating the universe and mankind and uh, then was he going to let them touch the tree of life, eat the fruit from the tree of life, which I am confident he knew, given their level of experience, they were going to violate. Was he then going to wipe out his entire creation, or had he planned to d be able to deal with that? Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8. Beloved, 2 Peter 3 and verse 8. Do not be ignorant of this one thing. That's pretty emphatic, isn't it? One day, 
And going back to the book of Genesis, he says, In the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. So we apply that definition of day back into Genesis chapter 2, where it says, in the day that you eat thereof, and we look at it as be, that day as being a thousand years, in the thousand year period that you eat thereof, you will surely die. Did they die during that thousand year period? Interestingly enough, I believe the book of uh, Genesis gives us the lifespan of Adam being 950 years, something like that, did not live out a thousand years, less than a thousand years. The day that he ate it, he died. In fact, no man, as far as the Bible records, has lived a thousand years. And you know what? Every one of those men have taken from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Haven't we all? Haven't we all? And we're not going to live for a thousand years. It's appointed, it says, to all men once to die. Afterwards, the judgment. <clears throat> one day is with the Lord is a thousand years. A thousand years is one day. Now so much of the world reads that to say that God can't really tell the difference in time. That time is flying for God. You know, a thousand years as a day. That's the reason I want to give a sermon on it because if you put it into context, you're not going to find that that's what Peter's talking about at all. So... One day, I, I, when I get around to it, <clears throat> the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Now, we don't use that terminology around here anyway. But in the deep south, they used to talk about, and I suppose they still do, being slack. That is, not, not keeping up your end of the bargain. And so it says, God is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness. But is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You see, what it's saying there is that God is allowing time so that all mankind can come to repentance. <clears throat> Sometimes, we see from the previous um, scriptures in, in Genesis and in 2 Peter, sometimes God speaks literally. Sometimes he speaks prophetically. In speaking prophetically, he can be talking about a thousand years. In speaking literally, he'd be talking about one day. How do we know the difference? How do we know the difference? Judgment is the weightier matter of the law. The Holy Spirit of God should motivate you to be able to see and understand what God is talking about. So can we believe God? Here's what happened in Genesis chapter 5. And this is regarded as, uh, it is the, the longest lifespan recorded of any man. Methuselah. And I'm told that, I didn't really research it for this sermonette, but I'm told that the name Methuselah means when he dies, the flood comes. That was the meaning of his name. God often has people named in uh, ways that reflect things like that. Methuselah lived 187 years and he begot Lamech. 
And Methuselah lived after he begot Lamech 782 years. And he had sons and daughters. Did any of them, did any of them survive the flood? The Bible only records eight people that survived the flood, right? Noah, Mrs. Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Mrs. Shem, Mrs. Ham, and Mrs. Japheth. That's eight people. Paul says eight people, eight souls survived the flood. All the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. And Lamech lived 182 years and begot a son. And he called his name Noah. The same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. God has not allowed a man to live more than one prophetic day. We can believe God. Romans chapter 3 and verse 4, this is the concluding line of the sermonette. Says, God forbid. Question, I guess, here having to do is God is God a liar? God forbid. Let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that you might be justified in your sayings and might overcome when you are judged. God forbid. God is true, though every man is a liar.